Hello and welcome to today's CBI at 10. Uh, my name is Kerry Thomas. I work for a little company called Tortoise. It's always a great pleasure to be doing these events here in conjunction with the CBI. And it's interesting, actually, we've done a lot of these things. It's interesting how often in these conversations we end up talking about subjects which in some ways until a few years ago, I think people might have seen as not really the province of business at all. We're focusing today on health, where I think, you know, my, my readout on that is until recently, um, the general reaction from business might have been health and safety, yes, you know, we, we're used to that, we acknowledge that, but, but health in the broader sense, is that really one for us? But the CBI has recently made health one of its priority programs and appointed one of our panelists today, Jordan Cummins, who I'll come to in a minute, uh, to, to take the lead on it. So we're looking at health and the role that, that business can play in it. I suppose in a sense, two roles actually, um, participating and uh, helping to expand the um, health economy in the UK. But I think more for our conversation this morning, um, what businesses can do to improve the health um, of their of the of their workforce and what and what might flow from that. So we have with us, as I said, Jordan Cummins, who is the program director for health at the CBI. Jordan, good morning. I'll come to you in a second. Um, we've also got uh, two great guests from outside the CBI. We've got Julie Billet, who is the director of operations for the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities, which is a government department um, formerly part of Public Health England. Now. Uh, part of what will come and Julie can tell me what, exactly how that um, how it fits and where and we've got Anna Bartle who's vice president of corporate affairs at the Estee Lauder group of companies so um, a great range of people this morning um, as ever though it really really helps both us on this conversation and the CBI more generally to hear from you what your thinking is about this what your experiences have been um, we'd love you to put the questions in we'll try to bring them into the conversation as quickly and as often as we can and they do help inform the CBI about bigger policy thoughts as well. So they're, they're incredibly useful to have. Um, so do that. And if you want to do it anonymously for whatever reason, then just put a non at the top of your comment and we'll make sure we treat, treat that in confidence. But we do look forward to hearing from you and don't, the, the, these, these things fly by. So do put your comments in sooner than, don't sit tight and wait because um, it doesn't end well. Um, Jordan, let me kick off with you um, and do what we always do, which is just to stand back um, away from the topic in front of us and just look at what's been happening more generally, COVID related particularly, I suppose, over the last period. Um, what, what's caught your eye? Thanks, Gary. Uh, and thanks for having me. Hopefully everyone can get me purely down uh, their, uh, their headset. So if there's a lot going on, I think it's fair to say. Uh, there's a lot that's happened in the first quarter uh, of this year. And there's a lot that's happened just this week uh, when we think about a health perspective. So if we take what happened on Monday, for example, the Prime Minister, a big speech, as he's done several times from number 10 over the last two years. Um, the new situation is this living with COVID strategy. So before we talk about kind of the wider economics, it's good to kind of situate where we are on coronavirus. Um, there's some big changes, I think, for business and for individuals alike. So um, good that we run through them. The first big changes I think that's, that's catching our eye is the end of the legal uh, requirement to self-isolate and whereby people testing positive will still be advised to stay from home, but the kind of legal framework around that will move away and that will happen from Thursday. Employees no longer need to tell their employers about whether or not um, they've got COVID uh, and their requirement to self-isolate. So um, that is a, that's a big one on our agenda uh, that's caught our eye this week. Second one from March. Uh, 24th of March of the temporary changes to statutory sick play and some of the employment support that was brought about at the start of the pandemic uh, will end. And then on the 1st of April, free testing will end. Free tests will now be targeted at the most vulnerable and those working in social care. So these are big chunky changes for businesses to get their heads around. Our initial reaction is that it's very clear the government are moving in a kind of symbolic fashion now. You know, they want to, they want this announcement to be uh, a big step uh, in terms of marking a return to normality. But as Julie will tell us more eloquently than I can, the virus is far from gone. So uh, uh, we need to keep close eye on this. It's also positive to see the government's continued emphasis on the vaccine programme, the ONS infection survey and the antivirals programme, which has started off very well. And that COVID infrastructure, if you will, which is, is a kind of famous CBI buzzword, uh, has been a core part of our messaging for the last two years. So keeping that infrastructure in place will really help to kind of um, keep 
uh, businesses confident about what comes forward. The end of mass testing though is going to be probably an issue for lots of businesses and we've heard that quite um, rapidly uh, I would say after the announcements um, after they were trailed last weekend and we recognize that things like te testing can't go on forever um, but lateral flow tests have been a real driver of confidence in supporting things like the return to office so we shouldn't underestimate the role that they've played in recent months and there are some big questions now I would say for lots of legal teams in businesses uh, asking about their duty of care especially towards clinically vulnerable staff members uh, and what power an employer has to prevent an employee who tests positive from coming into the workplace. So lots of firms will continue to take measures and will probably be quite cautious, I think we're, we're expecting. Um, the CBI will continue to kind of get these messages into government as fast as we possibly can. And Tony saw the business secretary on Monday to talk about lots of things going on in the economy, cost of living, energy crisis, which firms are also grappling with, but mainly on the announcements around coronavirus. So look out for the CBI in terms of our, our routes into government. If you're a member, please do get them to us. Uh, we will be using things like our virtual room network, our councils, the coronavirus inbox, which we continue to monitor. And we'll be updating our coronavirus hub as a kind of single uh, resource for businesses who are unsure about what comes next. And some FAQs will be in there. So please do send in your thoughts. But the big one for this week, I would say, that's caught our eye, Kerry, are those announcements on coronavirus. Um, big symbolic move from the government, some ongoing issues that we need to kind of grapple with uh, and some big questions from employers. And I mentioned cost of living, energy crisis, uh, supply chain strains are all kind of coming into play at the same time. So it's a bit of a perfect storm, I would say, at the minute. But the coronavirus uh, uh, restrictions were the ones that jumped out this week. OK, and, but Jordan, it sounds as if people on this call are feeling nervous about the end of mass testing in particular. Then you, you're saying that they're not alone and um, it, it's useful for them to get in touch with you. I think so. It's, uh, you know, lateral flows as a function have become a staple of all of our lives for the last however many months. Uh, I, there was a time probably before Christmas that I, I couldn't even conceive of going outside without doing a lateral flow test. So uh, it's a big part of our lives now and to, to kind of remove it immediately uh, or within the next kind of month or so is going to be a big deal. So if you're not alone, please do get in touch if you've got some concerns. Yeah. OK, well, thanks for that. Always useful just to catch up on the big picture. But let's turn now to, to the subject in front of us. Um, business and the health. I think when we come to Anna in a bit, she might challenge my idea that business that business may not have seen this as the problems of business, but we'll come to Anna shortly. But from the CBI's perspective, Jordan, what, what was it that led the CBI to designate this as a sort of important policy area and to put you in charge of it? That's a good question. Um, and a big question for us as an organisation, we've kind of historically dealt with uh, engagement with the NHS as a kind of offshoot of DHSC or the life sciences brief as a kind of economic enabler or, or kind of driver of trade at the CBI. But when we were designing the strategy up to 2030, when Tony Denker, our director general, came in, uh, there was a big feeling that there should be a health capability. If we're, never gonna, if we're, if we're not going to do it now, we'll never do it. Um, and it can't just be about COVID. It's got to be about the forward health of the economy. So that was Tony's challenge. That's the mantle that I've picked up. Um, and the economics behind it, the numbers behind it are pretty stark. You know, pre-pandemic, if you'd asked me if we were valuing health enough as an economy, I would probably say no. 131 million days a year, working days lost to mental and physical ill health. It costs us almost 100 billion a year, just less than half the NHS budget. And there are now half a million more people inactive in the labour market, not looking for a, a new job a big chunk of which is probably attributed to health as well. So the numbers behind this are huge. It's a huge drain on the economy, mental and physical ill health. So we think that there is a, a big opportunity for, for, the, for us here. Uh, there's a big opportunity for members to be more actively engaged. And even beyond just the kind of obvious things around infection rates, emerging from the pandemic, uh, mental health challenges were exacerbated, inactivity skyrocketed, and financial well-being for lots of people took a real hit. We've had two years of people's livelihoods in many cases being brought into question. So we're coming to this from a kind of how can business help perspective. It's not just about market making and I'm sure we'll get back to that later. And one thing that we're trying to grapple with is the kind of upstream people in their place of work can't be viewed as completely detached from the downstream, hospitals and primary care. They are inherently linked but for decades, they are, have been spoken about, definitely in public policy senses, as completely separate 
they require different diagnoses, they require different amounts of money, uh, they shouldn't be linked. And so I think there's a, there's a fresh approach now uh, needed from, from looking at the upstream and the downstream in, in, in a better way. And if we just think just for one minute about what a business could do on health, if you think about where we were on climate a few years ago, when everyone was saying there is this seismic, huge need, there is a consensus that we need to get to, to move us away from the conversation about this is a cost, this is a cost, to moving to a world in which it becomes competitive advantage. We moved the needle then a few years ago. And for me, on health, in terms of business's holistic role, feels a lot like where we were on climate a few years ago. So we're in this debate, uh, we're in this space to kind of move business forward on the positive outcomes not just to focus on frameworks, market making, but kind of the health of the nation more widely. So that's why we're doing it. Yeah. And do you think we're in a position already where particularly maybe younger employees coming into an organisation will come with an expectation that the business will have their well-being in the sort of full sense? You've made clear already that we're talking about both mental and physical health today you know, in the same breath. But is that now sort of set as an expectation, do you think? Uh, I think so, very firmly. You know, I've got um, lots of friends who work in very traditional industries like legal services um, who have had more kind of internal revolts about their health offer uh, in those kind of industries than they've ever seen in the years they've been working there. In fact, I read this morning that Clifford Chance have just been challenged to get a chief happiness officer by someone uh, that they're trying to recruit. So these roles, chief happiness officer, chief medical officer in traditional industries, they're going to go through the roof. We're going to see lots more of them pop up as people take it more seriously. And it could genuinely be the line between getting a great candidate and not getting a great candidate. You know, firms should think about it as a core part of their value proposition to the market. So I think it's going to grow. I think if you're not going to take it seriously, you're going to lose out on talent. Um, and if you want to be an employer of choice in the future, you really need to be good at this stuff. Great. OK, um, Jordan, that sets the scene really well and we'll come back to you shortly. But um, thank you so much so far. Let me come to Julie. Um, Julie, maybe you can just give us a sort of elevator pitch on the um, Office for Health Improvement and Disparities. What, what, what's just in a, in a few sentences? What's that? What's the role within the, the NHS or within government? Sure. Thanks, Kerry. So, uh, as you mentioned at the outset, the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities is a, is a newly created body uh, which which was set up following the sort of disestablishment of Public Health England it happened at the end towards the end of last year. Uh, and our remit um, is very much focused on improving the health of the nation and tackling inequalities in health. Um, other bits of the system have been moved into other places, so the, the clinic kind of focus on infectious diseases and other health hazards has moved into the UK Health Security Agency. And we work very closely with our colleagues there. But this, this new office, as part of the Department of Health, is very much uh, holding that baton around health improvement, really focusing on some of the issues that Jordan was talking about, uh, recognising that actually even pre-pandemic the, the some of the indicators around the health of our nation were were heading in the wrong direction actually things like life expectancy were starting to plateau whereas we've been used for used to many sort of years and decades of ever improving healthy uh, life expectancy um, and really wanting to understand what the determinants and drivers of the, that poor uh, those poor health outcomes were but particularly uh, this issue of um, some of our communities some of our population groups suffering particularly poor health. We know that that is related uh, to, to a whole range of um, sort of protected characteristics or dimensions around things like disadvantaged poverty, educational attainment, uh, ethnic inequalities in health. And so that the work of the office is really about understanding, um, acting on those drives and really trying to close those gaps so that we can ensure that everybody has the opportunity to really enjoy a, a sort of fulfilled and thriving life of which health is such a crucial part. Yeah, uh, Julie, I'll come to in a second to the question of how you see business playing into that. But but before we do that, you, I mean, you've mentioned some of the areas of concern, but without sort of mollycoddling us at quarter past ten in the morning, just paint us a picture of, of just how severe some of the health inequalities are, as you say, regionally, um, across different communities. Just g give us some examples of how, how stark the differences can be. Sure. So, I mean, I think there's a whole, whole host of ways in which you can describe this. I think almost every every bit of health that you want to look at, you can find an inequality dimension to it, Kerry. So whether you're talking about uh, cancer incidents or survival from cancer, whether you're talking about heart disease, whether you're talking about mental health and well-being, whether you're talking about infant mortality, every single area of health, I think, there isn't one where you wouldn't observe a really clear gradient. That's, that's the kind of language that we, we use, where we see uh, those, those differences in health that are 
unwarranted. So they're avoidable and preventable differences. Um, and some of those differences, I think, are very starkly manifested by geography in this country. So we see, uh, and that that's particularly very sort of of the moment when we think about the levelling up white paper. And we know that health and well-being will be a really important uh, consideration in thinking about levelling up of some of our communities in, in parts of the country where poor health, as Jordan said, is actually a real barrier to sort of flourishing economy locally because of the, the, the proportion of people that are out of work or are unable to work because of a health issue. Um, but we also see it at a very sort of micro ge geographical level. So even within, um, you know, I, I used to work as a director of public health in, in a borough in London. And within my borough, you would see a difference in life expectancy of 10 years between, uh, you know, go, traveling just a couple of tube stops on the on the London Underground. So a child born in one bit of my borough would, would have a, a life expectancy 10 years less than a, a child born a couple of miles down the road. And I think those those kinds of inequalities are just completely sort of unacceptable in today's uh, uh, mo modern society, really. So I think it's really about understanding and trying to act on those preventable and avoidable drivers of that inequality. Yeah. And if you look a little further afield and compare us to our European neighbours, let's say, are our health equalities, inequalities starker than theirs? I think they absolutely are. I think, um, you know, that there are a number of comparator studies that, you know, OECD studies that you can look at. And on a whole range of measures, I think, uh, unfortunately, the UK does come out as having some of those largest, largest inequalities and gaps, particularly on some of those, you know, the, the large uh, diseases where we see sort of early early death and early morbidity so cancer for example we have poor outcomes and very very clear gradients in those outcomes uh, across the country yeah okay and, and so let's turn to what business can do to, to close some of those gaps um, drive away some of those inequalities where how, how do you come to this debate about the role of business what, what, what do you think the position the role of business can be in, in your world I mean I, I, I think uh, I mean, I'm so excited about this conversation and, and sort of uh, the, 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 the sort of agenda that Jordan articulated, because I think that the role of business is enormous, actually, uh, Kerry. I think a uh, huge contribution and perhaps uh, I know Anna will, will come in and tell us some of her fantastic experience in SA Lauder. But I think it is a bit of an untapped opportunity. I think um, we spend such a huge amount of our life in work. Uh, that actually thinking about the workplace as a setting and a supportive environment that can really uh, help people to to manage their health and well-being, both physically and mentally, uh, it's sort of a bit of a no-brainer, really, that work has a really important uh, role to play. But, but aside from um, sort of employee workplace programmes and employee well-being, I think it's important to note that work in and of itself is good for our health. There's a whole host of evidence that points to the relationship between employment and health and unemployment and poor health. Um, so I think it's, you know, business is crucial and the, a flourishing economy is crucial to the, the health and wealth of the nation. Um, but I think, you know, we'd, we'd go back to someone like Michael Marmot's report around health inequalities, where he was very much focusing on a whole range of sort of social and economic drivers of, of health and well-being in this country and noting that, yes, employment is important, but what is also important is good, good work. And by good work, we mean uh, things like, you know, fair, fair pay, good terms and conditions, uh, a supportive environment, an inclusive environment, um, uh, you know, equitable practices in terms of diversity and inclusion in recruitment and retention, uh, a whole a whole range of things which uh, mean that people feel like they have a purpose, um, some autonomy and control over their working lives. I think all of those things are really important, as well as the more specific, purposeful health and well-being type programmes that employees can also, employers can also uh, consider. Great. OK, J Julie, we'll definitely come back to you very shortly, but let me just bring Anna into the conversation. Anna, good morning. Good to have you here. Hi. Um, before we come to Estee Lauder and your experience as a, as a, as a company or what you've done as a company, um, I mentioned that we were talking before the call started about um, the, my sort of framing of the issue as something that business might have thought not really are not really our job until relatively recently. You had a slightly dis different perspective on that. Well, just just remind me what it was. It, it was just through my own personal um, experience because some of what we've seen emerging in business uh, today and, and the very purpose of this conversation um, this morning about um, the role of business in health and in, in wider society um, got me thinking because I actually spent a, lo a lot of my childhood in Port Sunlight 
So my grandfather worked for um, the Lever Brothers factory, and they were employed in the uh, and and, uh, and accommodated in the Port Sunlight Model Village. Um, and I also consulted early on in my career for the Cadbury family, and obviously they had set up Bourneville. So this kind of Victorian philanthropic concept of caring for workers and understanding that not only was it morally and ethically the right thing to do, but it, it, but uh, sort of understanding that causal link between a better, happier, healthier workforce would be more productive and it becomes this virtuous circle. I think that they were onto something. Obviously, what we're seeing today is a much more progressive, inclusive, more just um, modern iteration of that. Um, but I do think that uh, there's a certain amount of resonance in, in that history just because of my own personal experience and having benefited from it. Um, so I very happily find myself in uh, an incredibly progressive and supportive um, global business, the Estee Lauder companies. Um, it's had a 75 year legacy um, of really putting um, values into action and, and very uh, genuinely and authentically putting people, positive impact and inclusivity, inclusivity at the heart of everything that it does. Um, Today, we have this um, very public, uh, publicly stated vision to be the most inclusive, diverse and equitable beauty company in the world. Um, and so that's a public declaration that we've made and we have to do everything that we can to stay true to that. Um, it can't just be empty words. You know, we've got to be modeling and practicing um, the behaviors on a daily basis. So um, even though we've had this 75 year legacy um, of, um, uh, you know, a commitment to these ideals and we define ourselves as a beauty inspired but values driven company, I think that you could really look over the past couple of years and the response to the pandemic at a, at a good um, sort of snapshot at how we channel some of that. So very, very early on um, in the pandemic, we set up um, a, a, our own dedicated global medical advisory board um, of incredibly eminent world-class um, medical professionals, uh, one of whom had been the former um, health advisor to um, Barack Obama, um, and then also likely worked with Biden. Um, and then their equivalents in all of our main regions around the world. And so what we tried to do was take our um, direction as a business from two compass points. One was that of the, um, the, the, the local leadership, so both the um, healthcare uh, leadership of, of, of markets, so in this market, Public Health England, the National Health Service, uh, but also from local governments and seeing what their guidance was. And then aligning that within the company, bringing that guidance back Back in and looking at it against our own values and our own sort of moral compass and, and our own science of, of thinking how do we put our employees and our customers and our wider stakeholder base, even looking at sort of suppliers and partners, um, how do we put them first and, and make sure that their health and safety is, is paramount. Um, so uh, standing up the uh, medical advisory board, taking decisions um, all along, and, and, it, and it was a daily kind of process. Um, we also recognized very quickly that being a primarily um, retail focused business um, and being in beauty, we have 95% female staff and 95% of our um, customers, broadly speaking around the world, um, are um, female. And it became apparent very, very quickly that, um, as always, women are often the first hit and the hardest hit um, by um, any issues uh, around the world. And so we stood up globally something called the ELC Cares Fund, um, which is now ongoing. It was driven and catalyzed by the COVID um, crisis uh, and the impact on our, on our workers and colleagues. Um, but now it's ongoing and it's a, it's a financial fund that offers um, uh, financial relief and aid uh, to um, colleagues who are going through different situations um, globally. So let me just jump in there, Annie, because you've raised a load of interesting things. Um, and I think one of the things we might want to get to on this call is just the sort of practical steps that companies, people can take if they're interested in, in sort of pursuing this agenda. Um, if I take something like the medical advisory board that you've talked about, as, a, as an employee of uh, one of your you know, group of companies, how, how do I feel the influence? How do I feel the impact of, of something like that advisory board? 
I think it's it's multi-layered, but in its simplest sense, it was about visibility. It was about the very start realization that we were suddenly from having been together every day and being able to feel physically present and and um, and in proximity, where there was suddenly a very dispersed and disparate workforce isolated at home. So it was using the power of um, of, of connectivity, of being able to reach people that um, actually sort of counterintuitively that even though we were physically further apart we've never felt um so so closely together and um and 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 sort of culturally um uh intimate as we did during that time and that's something borne out by um uh, anecdotal evidence and, and also surveys uh responses that we've had so what you might see is um we've got the company intranet and you would see health guidance uh coming out but written in a tone that was very very personal and human and empathetic um trying to uh recognize people's fears and allay them trying to um sort of tread that very delicate line between uh scientific sense and practicalities um with uh, an, an emotional sense backing it up um and i think um that the, we did a, a very good job of that but then it was also very practical being invited to frequent um seminars where you could have first-hand uh, medical advice. Uh, we also had um, a provision for a long time where you can have an online GP. So that's through an app on your phone. So that was already pre-existing. So um, we were, you know, listening to guidance about um, from from Public Health England about. Um, people that had issues should still use the medical services, but trying wherever we could to ease that burden by reminding people about the provision that we have ourselves. Um, the medical advisory board that, that we had, um, and we still do, you know, they're still very much present today, um, but they took a, a, um, an attitude of, of, of a holistic sense. They didn't draw a line between mental health and physical health, it was just health. Um, and so whilst in the first instances of the um, of the pandemic, there was obviously a great emphasis on physical health um, that then evolved into more of a focus on mental health and recognizing, you know, the fear and isolation and an impact of, um, of of working from home, which many described as more like living in the office. So um, just trying to constantly tune in, lean in, listen, be two way. Um, and, uh, and and just do the right thing. We've got an incredible uh, leadership. Fabrizio Freda, our CEO, um, is is amazing, but has an incredible leadership team behind him, all of whom were very, very physically uh, visible. I wouldn't say physically present, physically visible. So they made themselves obvious and accessible, and that really helped breed a culture um, that, that was uh, very positive. And Nancy right. Mann, who is our global um, executive vice president, President of um, Citizenship and Sustainability. She has this saying that I that I love because I think it encapsulates everything, our whole attitude. And she says it's never wrong to do the right thing. Okay. Anna, thank you. Um, I'll come back to you shortly. I want to just come back to you, Judy, because we had a question in from Philip Webb, which interested me, because I think it's, it, it gets to the heart of this point about where business fits in all the, you know, in your part of the forest, there are a number of different actors, obviously, and um, um, many, many different actors. And I think Philip's question is really about where business fits in that. So he, he says business has a role in the creation of, of health, wellness, well-being and wealth, but to impact on the wider determinants of health, housing, environment, living well, eating well, all that, all that stuff. Um, a better collaboration between health, social care and business needs to be considered because the current framework is, is doesn't support, it's too slow. Um, how do you think about Oh, you've got all dark on the studio. But, um, um, how, um, how do you think about how business fits into in, into the, particularly the framework of health, social care, and all those wider determinants that so so impact our, our health and well-being? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a really good question, and I think um, I, I feel quite optimistic about uh, that being something that will become hopefully easier and clearer going forward that i mean it, i don't want to get into sort of bureaucratic discussion about changes in the in the health system but um the creation of what uh, sort of a focus on what we're caught we call increasingly population health uh which is about um think you know it does what it says on the tin really thinking about a health of a population 
uh, in a place, in a community, and what are all the kind of various um, actors and uh, factors that, that contribute to that. And the NHS increasingly is organising itself on those sort of, um, in, in a more collaborative partnership way, working very closely with local government as the other key kind of statutory actor within a place. Um, and also seeing that as a kind of partnership endeavour with a much broader and more diverse sector of, of stakeholders, I would say, Kerry. So there's a lot of kind of, I can see I'm, it sounds like very bureaucratic language in there, but I think this notion of collaboration in a place in uh, amongst different and diverse partners is actually going to be a really kind of key part of the future of what we are calling sort of integrated care systems. So that's health, social care, voluntary and community sector, local government, and 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 the organisations that make up a community. And of course, business is a really critical part of that. Um, and so I think up until now, I think that, you know, that the ways in which business has been able to kind of engage and navigate those relationships at a local level has perhaps not been very apparent or easy. But I do feel optimistic with these changes um, and the development of those sort of integrated care systems. That, that does present a real opportunity. And I would really encourage businesses that are interested in pursuing that kind of um, collaboration and partnerships in, in sort of making those approaches at a local level through your health and well-being board, through your integrated care systems, because I think you will get a very positive uh, reception to those approaches now. So, so we're talking really, Julie, about business um, recognising its civic function as well as its, so not just the business of business is business, but actually a civic role that, um, that... Absolutely. I think, Kerry, I mean, we've talked a lot about um, you know, perhaps what you might term a sort of more cl classic role for business in terms of employee health and well-being and a focus on their role as employers. But I think there's a huge role for business, uh, absolutely in terms of their, them being part of a community and their civic role and responsibilities. So um, thinking about being anchored in a community, thinking about employment and you know, how, how do we extend the sort of pathways into employment through business reaching into some of our more disadvantaged communities if we want to come back to the issue of uh, inequalities, for example. We want to think about procurement and supply chains and thinking about using those levers to drive a focus on social value, on health equity. I think there's lots and lots of opportunities for business in, in all of its functions, not just as in its employer function. Um, a, a phrase that we use uh, more in the public sector is this notion of being an anchor institution. And I don't know whether that's a, a phrase that resonates or is recognised uh, amongst business more widely, but it's, it's definitely about recognising that broader contribution, that civic duty, and, and that the tentacles extend very broadly, I think, into the community. And there's multiple ways in which business can contribute to the health and wellbeing agenda, I think. Yeah, OK. Um, Julie, that's great. Jordan, let me just come back to you, because I'm, I'm sitting here feeling sort of mildly sympathetic to someone on the call who's perhaps running a small, medium-sized company, maybe hasn't got 75 years of progressive history behind them like Anna has at uh, Estee Lauder. Um, what, in just in very practical terms, um, I think you've got a kind of top-down, bottom-up question. Do you start at both ends? Where does this come from? Mm -hmm. uh, but also sort of first steps. What's your, what's your sort of off-the-cuff guide to um, how someone in that position should start thinking about this and, and what the right first buttons are to press? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, and different firms will have different management teams, amounts of money, they'll be local, they'll be national. Um, so it, it's really not a kind of Jordan's one size fits everyone. Uh, but if you were going to start, uh, I think the kind of scopes one to three that I was mentioning on carbon, it gives you a good frame. You know, what do I do in house? Number one, how do I treat my own staff? What is the offer I have? Does it go beyond statutory? How far does it go? Could I do more? Do I have money to do more? You know, really practical questions about uh, what I can provide in terms of provision. You know, once you've done that, you can then move into kind of outcomes. So what am I trying to achieve? Do, do I have really unhappy employees or do I have really unproductive employees? Or do I have a very specific type of health condition that seems to be spread among lots of employees that I need to solve? So there is a bit of provision and outcome analysis that I think almost any business can do, regardless of how big you are, I would say. Um, and once you've done that, then you can kind of track where you go next. So that's kind of the in-house bit. And then you move into kind of uh, what do I put out into the world? What are my product services, uh, goods that I'm asking people to buy from me? You know, and how does that affect the world? Um, and there are lots of businesses who've had to do this over recent years in terms of carbon emissions and sustainability. 
but do my products and services make the world healthier or unhealthier? It's a pretty simple question. And I guess if you can answer that, that gives you a good idea of what you need to do next. And then the last bucket is probably on how do I help more widely than just me? So if you think it goes kind of me, my world, the world as a kind of natural progression. Um, what could I do more, as Julie was saying, in my local community? You know, where can I reach out to help health outcomes? And it doesn't have to be seismic stuff. You know, you, you don't have to cure leukemia in a whole region if you're a single business. We're not asking you to do that. But you can reach people sometimes in a way that policymakers and institutions would only dream of reaching people. Businesses have a, a kind of a, a reach that is that is enviable. So think more about kind of how your brand can help at a kind of community level on that last one and how you can help local institutions do more. And once you break it into those buckets, it feels a little bit more manageable about what you start with and where you can kind of get to. And we'll be doing some work on this later in the year around your kind of health offer. So everything from statutory sick pay through to kind of rental loans and cancer screening at the top end. How do you know what you've got? How does it compare to the other people in the market? Where might you want to go further? And if you want a bit of help on that kind of benchmarking, that's what our team will be here to do. It'll help you on those kind of early steps. But if you if you try and whittle it down from a kind of God, I've got to solve the health of the nation into those kind of three buckets, very similar to those carbon scopes, it feels easier to tackle, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. Let me stay with you, Jordan, because we've had a question in from Anne James, who just asked whether you've been able to demonstrate at board level the benefits of well-being strategies, data around increased productivity, staff retention, those kind of things. Yeah, again, really good question and uh, varies by business. So there's no kind of common framework for measuring uh, well-being, I would say, across a kind of loads of different types of businesses of different sizes. So each firm will come to it with a different set of outcomes and stats that they're trying to get to um, is the first point I'd make because there's no kind of single set of reporting. There are um, some firms, often in the probably larger with more resource end, um, that have kind of gone heavy on the provision. So we offer lots of things to make people happier. Uh, and it sometimes feels like the prevailing orthodoxy is that the big boys are doing this best. You know, they've got all of the money in the world to do this. But actually, there are lots of smaller, medium sized enterprises who know their staff hugely, hugely deeply, um, who can kind of do a lot uh, for kind of uh, well being on a day to day basis that big firms could learn from. You know, if you've got as Anna said, tens of thousands of staff around the world, even the best managers on earth won't get to know people as deeply sometimes as a manufacturer with 10 people. So there are some two way learnings, I think, that can happen. Um, and we have lots of members who've got some really demonstrable evidence to show that very simple novel things like even focusing on management quality over kind of a year or two year basis has made a massive difference to the way people feel. Some of the kind of longer term condition management things around uh, 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 health inequalities within the workforce are di more difficult to get to with kind of well-being strategies and you need more points of provision. Um, but I would say that the, the orthodoxy of I just need to have more money to buy more services to make this better for my staff isn't necessarily the orthodoxy that we probably need to be uh, rowing behind. I think there's a small and large learning bit in your supply chain or your value chain that we can get to. Yeah, okay. Anna, let me just come back to you because I'm, I'm wondering if you if you think of that sort of long history of Estee Lauder thinking about and engaging in, in sort of health of its workforce. Would you is it fair to say that one of the things that has changed recently is a is a shift from what I imagined as a kind of slightly paternalistic approach to begin with to something that now perhaps bubbles up from underneath more? Is that part of what you're seeing at um, in your group of companies? Um. Well, first and foremost, we were founded by a woman and we primarily serve women. So um, paternalistic isn't generally a, a term that gets much airtime here. Um, <laughs> but but the, before I get to that, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, things that Julie and Jordan are saying really resonate. I think that Jordan has taken an incredibly complex and, and challenging um, mission and simplified it for, for people. It was it was good to, to mention about how small to medium sized businesses um, can do the right thing, because I do appreciate that we are in an incredibly privileged um, and much easier situation. Um, but to Judy's point about um, civic brands um, being present in the community, 
that's something that we fundamentally believe in. I am em emphatic um, in, in my commitment um, and my belief that um, uh, corporate brands should be playing a role properly in society. Um, and that starts literally within the geography of, of where they, um, they have a footprint. So for instance, in London, we're situated in Fitzrovia and um, you know, we make sure that we support um, local businesses, local schools. We um, have had a six year um, partnership with a breast cancer charity called Future Dreams, who we supported um, to open um, a breast cancer community center down in King's Cross um, during the pandemic. Um, and that was really important to us because their mission very much aligned with ours around our attitude to inclusion, diversity and, and equity um, in that uh, we both to had a mutual understanding um, that breast cancer and the, and the, the work that has been done around awareness um, has only penetrated so far. And if you are a, a, a white, primarily middle-class, middle-aged woman, speaking in huge generalizations here, um, you've come a lot further in your understanding about um, uh, breast cancer and health. Um, but if you're younger or if you are black or Asian, um, if you are situated um, in, in the north of England, um, then the, uh, the awareness and education is um, not nearly uh, at the levels that we would like to see it. So we commissioned a piece of research last year in order to get a better understanding of that, which we shared um, and have got spokespeople and um, uh, really trying to um, preach that message of about a much more extensive and inclusive uh, breast cancer conversation. Um, so, so that's one thing that we're doing to model inclusion and diversity and community action um, in one area. Um, uh, but I, I wanted to go sort of further back and look also at the commitments that we have made with um, education and literacy at early stages, um, because I think that um, most people would understand the link between, you know, good academic um, attainment and, and grounding to um, having healthier outcomes um, ultimately. So we believe that, you know, we're sort of working at, at both ends, um, doing things for um, uh, women's health now, but also investing in uh, young people's um, education um, and working with the National Literacy Trust around um, uh, uh, reading and so forth. We've got facilities down in Hampshire as well, uh, where we have been putting libraries back into schools, for instance. Um, and then we make sure that we have relationships with um, uh, the local constituents and the, um, the, the relevant members of parliament down there so that they can understand what we're doing. And we can mostly understand what they need and what their constituents are looking for. But we're very, you know, we're not the kind of the, the civic hero. You know, I am very, realistic about what we are able to achieve and it can all sound very slick and very ideal in in a short format like this and it's far from it there is always much much more that we can do um but uh you know at least we're trying indeed anna thank you um we're actually racing towards the, the end of this as i knew we would julie let me come back to you for what may well be the the final word as you sit there listening to this conversation we're talking a lot about what business can do is already doing could do better um what are your thoughts on what the nhs could do better the social care system could do better government could do better uh, uh, policy makers could do better to to locate business within this conversation and, and sort of foster those relationships yeah, really good question, Kerry. I mean, I think um, I think it perhaps comes back to the earlier point about just more more. I think talking about this more leadership on this agenda, more visibly recognising and talking about the contribution of business into into the health and wellbeing agenda, uh, and and brokering and inviting in, if you like, um, uh, those relationships between perhaps the sort of statutory sector and and the sort of normal sort of structures that we all recognise in terms of NHS and social care and business. I don't think we've necessarily made it easy at a local level for those relationships to, to form in a very deep and meaningful way. Um, but actually, you know, just in just in a very small example of that in, in London, where we've been focusing on the COVID vaccination programme, for example, we have forged fantastic relationships with business as a way, exactly as Jordan said, of reaching communities we couldn't reach. Um, on our own. And, and I just think there's some very practical, tangible ways in which those relationships being built more deeply between business and 
the NHS and social care, well, you, there will be a myriad of opportunities for some practical, tangible uh, things to happen and for differences to be made. Great. OK, Julie, that's a great note to end on. Um, and we are now um, at the end of today's uh, conversation. I want to thank Anna, Julie, Jordan. I think just sort of standing back from it, what's, what strikes me just reflecting on my own experience of work is that I think, you know, which is quite long now, when I came into the workplace, I think I would have been like, you know, it, the common feeling would have been that your workplace was likely to punish you if you became ill. And, and so it's really kind of striking and quite heartening to have a very difficult different conversation where um, you know that, that may exist in some tiny pockets but what we're really talking about is uh, how a supportive engaged progressive workplace can you know be good for itself be good for the business but also good for you know its employees and good for civic society as well so, so it's been a really fascinating conversation it seems like there's real there's real scope here so great to know that the CBI is um, you know, through Jordan uh, sort of tucking into it um, we are back this time next week, next Wednesday, for a conversation about the Go for Growth campaign, looking ahead to the Chancellor's Spring Statement, which I think is on March the 23rd from memory, but um, uh, so that's next Wednesday. But um, thanks for your company today, and we'll see you very soon.